It's some time, right? To ask, you can ask any question about Ramadan, about the mosque, about some of the activism the mosque is doing, about the faith of Islam. Now, this is your time. And we have our young volunteers. You can raise your hand and they can bring the mic to you. There. This isn't a very substantial question, but I've been looking at the tiles back here. Um, and I noticed one where the, the spelling in Arabic is different, but it says the same thing. And I've, I've since lost it. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, I'm glad that you noticed this wonderful, you know, backdrop over here. So the tiles that you see, these are the 99 names of God mentioned in the Quran. God has more than 99, by the way. But, uh, you know, people, they take out 99 names and that Arabic and then the English translation of the names. For example, it says over here that he is Al-Baqi, he is the ever surviving and he is the self-sufficient. You know, we need to eat, we need to drink. God is independent, he is self-sufficient. Uh, he is the supreme partner, right? He is the very first and he is the very last. He is eternal. He is the most merciful, he is the most forgiving, he is the creator, he is the loving God. He, he wants to guide humanity, he's a guide. So these are some of the names, as you can see up there, which are inscribed in a nice calligraphy. Oh dear, I should have thought more before I took the mic. I'm just, I'm taking it in right now. Oh, any other concept within Islam too, by the way? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. What, you may, your, what you may have seen or what sometimes the media covers, right? right. Anything what that you want to. Just about Ramadan, how does worship practices, how do they differ during the month of Ramadan? Sure. So the question is, how do, uh, so how is a typical day of a Muslim in Ramadan perhaps? All right. So we wake up uh, in the morning. So before we start fasting at 4.30 a.m., that's when the fasting starts approximately. We wake up like maybe half an hour or maybe 45 minutes or so. Then we have a light meal. So just to make sure that we carry on ourselves, right? Because if we don't have that meal, it will be becoming more harder. Then we do the very first prayer of the day. The very first prayer of the day, which I was telling to uh, our reporter up there, the very first prayer, so we pray five times a day, right? So the very first prayer is before sunrise. So we do that very first prayer and then we do some recitation of the Quran. And then some people take a nap, some people go to work or go to schools and colleges. And all throughout the day, we should be more conscious of reading the Quran more, you know, praying more, uh, thanking God more, all throughout the day. And then we break the fast at uh, sunset. Right after sunset is the fourth prayer of the day. So after we pray, then, um, then the dinner is there, right? Then after the dinner, uh, then we go to the mosque and we pray the fifth prayer of the day. After the fifth prayer, there is an extra optional prayers that we do. And they last all the way until like sometimes midnight, sometimes 11 p.m. Uh, so that's kind of a typical day. But as I mentioned, we are supposed to be more conscious of God, more thankful of God, right? Inculcating all the good things that sometimes we neglect in our daily hectic life. We are more conscious during this time. That means connecting with God more, connecting with the Quran more, right? Recitation, uh, connecting with the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, connecting with the neighbor. So we are more conscious, more active in this month. Since we are speaking about the Quran, the, you know, one special uh, aspect of the Quran is that people have memorized the whole Quran. That should be like amazing for some of you who may be familiar only with the Old Testament, New Testament, the Vedas. There are Muslims who memorize the whole Quran. So just with the show of hands in this room, how many Muslims have memorized the whole Quran? Show of hand. Just raise your hand or stand up. Go ahead, go ahead, guys. Nobody can see. Okay, one over here, two, mashallah, right? All right, give them a big hand. You know, they memorize the whole Quran. And the rest of the Muslims, even the younger children, they have memorized, let's say, 20 chapters of the Quran in Arabic, by the way, 20, 30, 40, 50. People have memorized, like every Muslim, we memorize many chapters of the Quran because when we uh, read, the five daily prayers, we don't have the Quran in front of us. One more. So we don't have uh, the Quran in front of us. We just uh, recite from the memory. So that's one of the miracles of the Quran that in this time and age, there are 15 million Muslims all over the world. Starting from children, three, four, five years of age, all the way to people in the 90s, they memorize the whole Quran. 
Now, how many uh, pages of the Bible have you memorized, right? <laughs> Zero. Zero. So that's one of the miracles because God, Allah says in the Quran, chapter 15, verse number 9, that it is God who has sent down this message and he will protect it. And this is the way God is protecting it because Quran is meant to be as a guidance, not just for Muslims, but all of humanity. And uh, so once, I mean, since all of you have a gift package, I would really encourage you to read it and get the message from it and the solutions from it. You can also see uh, in the Quran, the stories of the previous prophets, their message of oneness of God, their challenges, their miracles. So many of the items that you see in the Old New Testament, you can see in a profound way explained also in the Quran. Anything else since you have the mic? Um, what's the primary way that you um, address Islamophobia in the community? Sure, that's a really important question. If you also want to address it, you could. What is, so, so the question is, how do we address Islamophobia, right? So Islamophobia, I would say, it's a, it's a symptom of lack of education. As I mentioned, when I was in India, I have uh, American phobia, all right? I did, by the way. I used to watch all of this, you know, Hollywood, not Hollywood, yeah, Hollywood movies. And the only impression I had was, you know, every American is like, you know, Al Capone, all right? They have the guns and they shoot each other out. So I have American phobia when I was in India. But once I came here, met my neighbors, went to school, right? Interacted with the fellow Americans, my American phobia went away. So I would say the best way to address Islamophobia is the Muslims, we have to make an effort to have outreach programs like these. And for, yes, why not? Yes. Many more, right? Many more, by the way. And for our fellow Americans who are not from the Islamic faith, you have a right and you have a duty to learn about what Islam is, who Muslims are. You know, Islam is the faith of two billion people. So it's important for you to know why are these people believing in Islam? What is their background? What culture? What, uh, you know, what is their book? What practices? What rituals? So once we learn about each other, especially about Islam because Islamophobia is there, you can see that Islam is not a threat to the society. Islam is in fact a blessing to the society. So I would say that both sides, we have to work on our education. Muslims to educate our fellow Americans by good actions and good words, right? And our fellow Americans, you also have to uh, you know, educate yourself uh, and not take your Islam or about Muslims in the mosque only from the media, but interacting with the Muslims, asking the questions, coming to the mosque, asking from the Imam, and especially gatherings like these. So I would say, education and God's guidance is the best way to eradicate not only Islamophobia, right, but anti-Semitism. And any ism that is there, that is diluting the society and making walls with each other, education and interacting would be the best way to eradicate Islamophobia. Yes. Yes. Some of the people might not know the word Allah. Oh, that's a really important. Uh, some of you, you may not know the word Allah. So our guest over here, have you heard the word Allah before? Yes, some of you have, right? So when we say the word Allah, we are not worshipping a different God. So the Arabic word for the creator is Allah. You know, just like in the Hebrew language, you have uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, right? Elohim. Just like in Spanish, you have Dios. Uh, just like in English, you have the Creator. Just like in Aramaic, which is the language of Jesus, it is Allah. In the same way, in Arabic, the word for the Creator is Allah. So when we say the word Allah, we are not worshipping a different God. God. Allah is not the God of the, you know, the Arabs and the, the Indian, Pakistani Muslims. Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. You know, you'll be surprised to find out in the Arabic Bibles, right? Bible has also been translated into Arabic. In the Arabic Bible, Genesis chapter 1 verse number 1 says, In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So Allah is not a different God, the same creator in Arabic is called as Allah. And he has wonderful attributes as you have seen over here. He has wonderful attributes and one of the important concepts of God is that God does not have a father and God does not have children, sons and daughters and grandchildren, 
uncles and aunts god is one god is unique and he is the creator of all the universe good question okay one more question or done all right so we are done so again on behalf of the mosque on behalf of the muslim community and behalf of all the muslims again we really thank you for coming over here mingle with the muslims right and don't make this as the only time that you're coming here you're welcome to come here many many more times and not just to come over here let's work together the mosque and the and the temples right and the churches and the synagogues so as one human family inshallah god willing by god's guidance we can make better societies May God help us all. Thank you very much.